So, uh, I'm just going to begin with a, a question that you would think we all would automatically know the answer to, which is, what is food? Um, we kind of know in one way, because we all eat every day, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But in another way, we don't actually really think about what food is. So, I'll just give you one formulation. Food is living things that we kill in order to live. And when you put it like that, you realize that food is both the most inherently valuable thing in the world, but also the most ethically challenging, because we kill in order to eat. So the mere act of eating engages us in the cycle of life. Um, Rene touched on it. We evolved through food. Our mutual need to eat is the most powerful thing bringing us together. And the fact that if we collaborate in order to eat, we eat better, is really the wellspring of how society has evolved. The need to share, and again, I mean, everything I'm going to say today, there's a sort of five-hour discussion that could go straight into it, is really what helped us to evolve collaboration, language, the idea that we're not in the world alone, but we need to collaborate to lead better lives. It's our identity. I don't know which of this looks more like what you'd like to eat for lunch. Um, I, I occasionally eat the thing on the left. Um, but, you know, how we, how we relate this thing on our plates, and again, as Rene said, you know, do we think, okay, that was once an animal? Uh, or do we think, okay, that was once a landscape? Or do we kind of switch off and just shovel this stuff in because we've got something much better to do? And it goes even deeper than that, because the way we relate to the world through food completely changes our perspective of how we sort of see ourselves sitting in the world. Um, it always amuses me that the animals on the left in our culture are considered to be yummy, and the ones on the right are considered to be yuck. I know, again, this is something René's addressed in his work. Um, but, of course, two billion people on the planet eat insects as a regular part of their diet. So it's incredibly powerful the way food actually shapes the way we think. And it's not just the food itself, it's actually also how we see ourselves. So historically, we've arranged spaces, uh, and indeed cities and landscapes, according to who gets to eat, with whom, and how, who is visible or invisible when the act of eating is taking place, who's behind the scenes or front of stage. And how you eat and what you eat defines status really, really powerfully. And it's interesting that historically, very few people have been privileged to eat, as the ones on the right here have. But now, if you think about it, the ready meal culture, in a way, brings this sort of privilege of not having to think about food which used to be the privilege of kings and royalty to everyone. So we're, we're inherently sort of uh, prejudiced towards not wanting to think about food, not wanting to confront the fact, as I said at the beginning, that this is living things that we're killing in order to eat. Now you can understand, and, and really this is what I do, uh, all of civilization as a, uh, an, a sort of attempt to eat better or rather an attempt to solve the problem of needing to eat um, and through that actually free ourselves up to do other things. It's very interesting though that hunter-gatherer society is almost exclusively uh, just, as again Rennie said, see the world that they live in as the larder. There is no separation between them and the need to eat. And when farming was invented around about 12,000 years ago, it's often represented as a punishment, and this is very, very common in all societies, including Christianity. And the reason for that is that it seemed like very hard work, and it was, in fact, very hard work. Life expectancies dropped, people got shorter, they, they developed all sorts of dreadful diseases when we began to farm. And this is because the diversity of food they were eating shrank dramatically, and also they just weren't very good at it. They hadn't really worked out how to do it yet. So we invented the word work, the concept of working, when we invented this radical new way of feeding ourselves. Um, and in fact, the, the fact that it was really hard, it, you know, it began to be seen as a really hard thing to do to feed ourselves, gave rise to this fantasy 
which is very prevalent in the Middle Ages, this fantasy that you didn't have to work in order to eat, and that the world itself was just going to be uh, designed as a sort of an edible landscape that you could just gorge yourself on and then fall asleep under a tree. So this is known as the land of cocaine, and it was a very common vision in peasant life in the Middle Ages. So this, if you, if you like, is the ultimate life hack um, that's been around with us for, for centuries. The idea that you can somehow miraculously solve the food problem without having to, to work for it. Now, out of this new way of feeding ourselves came a new way of living. Uh, it's called urbanity. Um, and it brings all sorts of benefits, but it also brings all sorts of problems. This is one of the first cities ever built. It's Ur. Uh, it's in the modern Iraq, the uh, valley of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that came down through ancient, I should have had the map, obviously, uh, through ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and one of the things that you notice about this first city is that it's very small, it's compact, it's only about uh, 500 meters across, it's surrounded by farmland, it's on a river, the river brought uh, irrigation, obviously drinking water, but also the possibility of transport. And in the middle is a large temple, which if you look closely, you can see about a quarter of it is a major granary. And in fact, the temple organized the harvest in these early cities. Um, and it was a sort of, if you like, spiritualized central food distribution hub. Um, and that is the way early cities solved the problem of feeding themselves. They were really what we would now call city-states. Um, and it was the city and the countryside living in symbiosis. And farming was basically the most important thing that the city did. In fact, lang uh, language having been invented for hunting and gathering, then formed into writing so people could keep the farm accounts and so on. Now, a very important thing. It's amazing I've had seven minutes already. Ugh, and I'm only about a fifth of the way through. Oh, well. So um, that's the trouble when you try to talk about all of civilization in 20 minutes. Anyway, but here's an important thing. Um, Aristotle, Aristotle actually said two really important things. A, he called humans political animals. And he said that because we need to be together to be sociable. This is why, we, this is why building cities is such a great thing. It's lovely to be here today. But we are animals, and this means that we still need a relationship to the natural world. Now, this is a paradox, because the more we live in cities to be with one another, the further and further away we get from nature, which is our vital source of sustenance. Now, the Greeks worried about this a lot. And in fact, both Plato and Aristotle wrote at great length about how you, you know, what an ideal city was. And they wrote about limiting the size of the city so that you could have the ideal kind of sociability. Plato said, everyone knows everybody else. This is what we want. But they also worried about how the city was going to be fed. And the concept of this was economia. And you might, that word might seem a little bit familiar because, of course, it's the basis of our modern word economics. The interesting thing is, and I'm going to bin the rest of my lecture just to make this point because it's so, so important. Eco economia comes from the Greek word oikos, which means house and nomos, which means uh, uh, management, basically. So, economia is household management. And in fact, Aristotle talked about how the polis, the city, was actually built up from little houses, feeding themselves, and then growing to villages, and then eventually growing to the city. So the whole idea was that the ideal state was one that could feed itself, uh, and that took care of its own economy because it was about basically self-sustaining and, and having this relationship, solving, if you like, the urban paradox. And in fact, that's what most early cities were like. My favorite example of the plan B, as it were, the, the, a place that the German sociologist Werner Sobart called the consumption city, Rome. Um, and Rome went in exactly the opposite direction. Instead of staying small and feeding itself from its local hinterland, it got into ships and it conquered sequentially uh, Sicily, Sardinia, the little point, it doesn't work, you know where they are, Carthage, Egypt, and so on, and brought the food in from all over the known world. Uh, so this, as I say, is the opposite model. Uh, and in fact, Roman poets used to say that, oh, Rome used to produce all its own wheat, but now all we produce is roses and we get our wheat from Egypt. And this was seen as a sign of decadence and so on. 
And as I don't have to tell you, this is the model that predominantly is now going global. Um, and as I say, I, when you talk about civilization in 20 minutes, you have to kind of skip over rather large chunks of the story. Um, now, nevertheless, it was very, very difficult for Rome to do what it did, if I just go back. Um, you'll see that it would have been very difficult for another city the size of Rome, which had a million citizens, by the way, by the third century AD, to have fed itself because Rome was sucking up all the food from that entire vast territory. Um, and it needed the sea to do that because that was the way, the only way it could easily bring food in. But when the railways come along, this sort of constraint of geography finally disappears. Uh, you can suddenly bring food in long distances. And this is the thing that's limited the sizes of cities up to this point. So we say goodbye to geography. This means that cities can grow any size and shape they like. This is London expanding vastly after the arrival of the railways. And of course, if transport of food was a problem, um, it not only meant that cities could go bigger, but the, the agricultural landscape feeding them could also expand exponentially. Um, so this is an example of what happened in America when there's a fantastic book called Nature's Metropolis I hugely recommend to you about the evolution of Chicago. The commodification of food, uh, the commodification of grain, uh, which is no longer little farmers coming in on their separate wagons, but going into big grain silos, so it becomes just random stuff that can then be traded on futures markets and so on. And also, for the first time in history, a grain glut, because if you can convert lots of grassland into uh, grain production uh, by using railways to transport it, you have more than you need. People came up with the brilliant idea of feeding it to cattle, uh, and that is really the beginning of this weird invention that we've made called cheap food. Uh, and another thing I need to pause on is that uh, it is shocking that we expect food to be cheap. Um, and in the West, I mean, we've really predicated a whole development model on the idea that food should be cheap. But food, as I said at the beginning, is the most inherently precious thing in our lives. So if we expect food to be cheap, what does that say about the way we value life? Anyway, uh, it didn't all go according to plan. Uh, there's a fantastic expose written about the Chicago uh, Union stockyards uh, by Upton Sinclair, uh, basically called The Jungle, uh, which really exposed the horrific conditions for animals and humans that was producing this cheap food. People immediately stopped eating meat, uh, or cheap meat, or mince meat, and so on, which, of course, was a disaster, because this had become a mainstay of the American diet. Um, but there was a response, a design response, uh, which was a series of hamburger joints called White Tower and White Castle that had all this white, shiny imagery uh, that made people feel that everything was clean and okay. And also they, they sort of smart bombed these things into cities. And all the advertising was about scale. So they said, oh, when you eat in a white tower, it's fine because you're eating the same hamburger that millions of other people are eating. So it's, it's really cool. It's a kind of wildebeest going across a crocodile-infested river sort of form of reassurance. Um, I'll explain that later if that didn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> safety in numbers, basically. Um, of course, the, the land just disappeared because if you replace grassland with monocultural uh, annual seeds, the soil is no longer held in place. So that just blew away. That was fantastic. Um, that was ironic. Sorry, I just... <laughs> um, and of course, that's the beginning of the so-called organic food movement, although, as we know, all food is organic. So it's really weird that we have just this one little section of it that we call organic because all food is organic. But, you know, this, this search for plan B. Um, but, of course, plan A was already set in place. There's a lot of money uh, to be made in feeding people, quote-unquote, cheap food where all the true costs are externalized. Uh, and as we know, it's not doing us any good, as Rene mentioned. Um, it's achieved by externalizing, as I say, a huge number of really horrific things that are destroying the planet. Very briefly, you know some of this, 20% of global farmland is degraded or lost because of monocultural production. Uh, about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions are created by industrial farming. Uh, about 70% of global fresh water is being used in farming. A lot of that is from non-renewable resources, which means it's running out. Two billion overweight or obese, one billion living in hunger, 
About 50% of lakes globally are suffering from eutrophication, which is from excessive runoff from nitrogenous fertilizers. Um, we waste a lot of food. You know that. We're going to talk a lot about that. Um, and the world is moving towards a, a, a meat-based diet, a westernized meat-based diet. About 97% of meat that's consumed globally now is produced on this system that was invented in Chicago, i.e. feeding grain to cattle, industrialized systems. Um, and the world is turning into a hamburger for many other reasons. Again, I wish I had more time to explain. There's invested money in it. It's very powerful, uh, and people like eating this way. It's kind of salt, sugar, and fat, the three flavor enhancers that none of us can say no to. And they never exist together in nature, so we have no inherent resistance to it. As I said at the beginning, the old peasant dream of the world being made of food has come real, and it doesn't do us any good. So what are we going to do about this? Well, the first thing we have to do is to learn to see through food. And I often say that, you know, I don't really talk about food. I love food, and I do talk a lot about it. But what I'm really talking about is food as a lens, food as a way of seeing the world. So just like Rennie wants kids to sort of pick up something from the pavement and eat it, which I think is fantastic, I want you to stick an imaginary pair of pineapple-shaped glasses on your head and see everything through food. That means that uh, we don't live in utopia. I think we all know that. We don't live in a good place. We'd like to, uh, but it's just very difficult to achieve perfection. However, we do live in Sitopia. We do live in a food place, a world shaped by, by food. And again, with longer, I could explain to you more how our bodies, our homes, our cities, our landscapes, our habits, our sociability, our biennial rhythms, everything is shaped by food. So this is the world that we live in, um, and it's a way of seeing that allows you to see in a different way. You see that food is a flow that flows from landscape through, it might go through RDCs, regional distribution center, some distribution process into the city, into a market or a supermarket, into our kitchens where we probably just shove it in a microwave, or maybe we cook if you're really lucky. Uh, we eat almost certainly not around a table um, because very few of us do that now, uh, and then back into the waste system. This is a constant everlasting flow that we can shape in any way we choose. But it's much more complex than that because every stage of that flow is affected by every other stage, by habits, belief preferences, my granny didn't tell me how to do that, etc. So what we're really talking about is complexity, but actually we understand complexity because we all eat. So if you think about what you eat, this is a fantastic book called Hungry Planet, just went around the world in asking people what they eat and then put that against a whole series of statistics about you know, uh, life expectancy, whether people actually ate together and so on. We create a series of landscapes out of that process and it determines whether we have cows eating grass, as they evolved to do, or wandering around in concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, you know, being pumped full of antibiotics because they can't digest the grain that we feed them. Do we get social benefits out of buying food? Do we go into the city and animate public space, which is what we used to do in the city, or do we scuttle off to supermarkets? Um, do we eat together? Um, or do we, my favorite stat, 20% of meals in America are eaten in cars, and it's creeping up. And that just, if you go back to the beginning of what I said, that we evolve socially around food, the need to share food, it really makes you question where we're going as society, that we don't have time to sit down and eat together. Now, I have 20 seconds to give you another 15 slides, so I'll just go <laughs> really quickly. Um, it's about our relationship with technology, and it's about our use of technology to try and live better. It's about our idea of progress. We think that the woman on the right is having a better life than the guy on the left. That's the tacit assumption that is made in the models that we've created about a good life. We think that we can just carry on going along this. I can have five minutes. Wow, I've just been given five minutes. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, we think that we can solve the problems that we've created by just getting more and more clever about the technology which has got us here in the first place. And this is actually, and by the way, I mean the Harbour Bosch process on the left. I just out of interest, how many people in this room know what that is? Stick your hand up. Amazing. So five people in this room know that without the Harbour Bosch process, 
roughly half the people on the planet wouldn't be alive because it's the process by which we make nitrogenous fertilizer and that feeds about half the planet. So it's just interesting, isn't it? So anyway, uh, the thing on the right is lab meat, which is being subsidized by Google. So do we really want to go in this direction? And then, of course, I'm sure you've heard of Soylent, the ultimate life hack. So this really is the sort of land of cocaine coming full circle. We're so busy. We're so busy doing really important things that we don't even want to have food anymore. We're just going to have baby food in kind of plastic things. That we're gonna, but by the way, they do come in different flavors, just in case drinking the same porridge for the rest of your life is just too depressing. Um, and this is what you look like if you live on silent, apparently, according to them. But of course, as we know, this is probably the way we're really heading. And in fact, I mean, what's this is an amazing film called wall -E. I highly recommend it. It really, it satirizes but very accurately where our logical thinking about a good life is taking us. You know, they've left Earth by this point, humans, and they're just sucking constantly on some sludge. They're watching screens and they're two factor walks, so they're on sort of floating beds. And this is a robot called Wally, -E, who's very worried about humanity. So, you know, the question of what is a good life comes up when you think through food. I mean, some of you probably know Tristram Stewart, his fantastic program globally to sort of bring, you know, highlight how much food is wasted and, and in our lives. And that, if we did that, would change everything. Uh, there's uh, an in our lives, and that, if we did that, would change everything. Uh, there's uh, an enormous, I mean, if you believe and understand that the food system mirrors society directly, you would be really worried if you knew that the food system looked like this, which it does look like. This is a, a diagram of a study done uh, by Jan Willem Grieving in the Netherlands about the, the way uh, 160 million consumers in Europe are fed by 3 million farmers via just 110 supermarket buying desks. So this is monopoly. So as I say, if you, if you understand that how powerfully the food system mirrors society, then you would really worry about a food system that looks like that. What do we do about it? Well, uh, I recommend that we go back to the idea of economia, uh, which is the basis of economics, uh, which is basically household management, as I said. And I think what we need, I would call it Sotopian economics. I would say that we need to internalize the true cost of food. Now, that's a very revolutionary thing to say as well, because if you start to do that, some food that we already have, such as organic, artisanal, local food, would cost roughly what it does now. Whereas industrial food would very quickly become completely unaffordable. That would mean that a lot of people wouldn't be able to eat. Then we'd have to look at why we have societies, rich societies in the world, where people can't afford to pay real money for food. So it becomes an all-encompassing social thing. The true value of food is visible in parts of the world where there isn't enough of it. Uh, it's usually visible when there's a crisis. In, in Europe, that was in the Second World War. It was in uh, Cuba after the fall of the Soviet uh, Union. It was in Detroit after all the cars left. People immediately go back to growing food because that's what they have to do. And they really value it. They don't waste a single thing. It's about remembering that what we're talking about is the biggest source of pleasure that any of us have. We're literally physiologically wired to love eating because it's really good for us to eat well. So do we exclude food and just turn it into a thing we don't have time for, or do we really make it the core of our lives? It's about democratizing the food system. So it's about joining the roots to the branches of that monopolistic tree so that the food system begins actually to look like the kind of society we want to might, might want to live in. And if we put more value into food, if we internalize the true value of food, then suddenly everything that William Morris was dreaming about, bringing back craft, bringing back good work, the foundation of a good life is possible. And this is happening in what we call the food movement. So 20 years ago, there were no artisanal cheese producers in Britain. There's now over 300 because this new movement of understanding and enjoying food has come back. It's what Carlo Petrini calls co-producing. It's all these ways that we can meet producers halfway and actually not just passively receive food, but actually actively get engaged in producing it. 
And it's about thinking through food at every level, so not just in terms of what am I going to have for dinner, but seeing it as a thing that shapes the world and using it to shape it better. So looking at re the regions, productive regions outside cities, the central thing above me, the, the garden city, Ebenezer Howard's amazing uh, idea of combining city, urban and rural life, bringing back the city-state, sepals, continuous production urban landscapes, bringing farmland and bringing nature into the city, local infrastructure, patchwork farms, so we grow some food in the city and we grow some outside. And last but not least, it's about realizing that technology is not our enemy and it's not our panacea either, it's our servant, it's our tool, and we have to use it in the service of an idea of a good life, which must be, of course, about our relationship with nature in the end, because we are political animals, ways of growing food that actually allow nature to thrive as well. What does Cytopia look like? An ideal one, probably it looks like this, my favorite image, the Lawrence Setti, Allegory of the Effects of Good Government, which is a very useful title to finish on, because this is my last slide. Um, it's about acknowledging that valuing the people and the landscapes where our food comes from and seeing them as absolutely integral to our lives is our only way forward to a good life and also one that doesn't involve endless consumption as Rome did but actually balances, brings back economia in its true sense to the world. So by valuing food and loving it and enjoying it together we can build a better world, a better Zootopia. Thank you very much.